Okay, we are discussing neoclassicism today and um, I am going to be talking to you about some history of what happened during neoclassicism. We are going to talk about the artworks, the style, or not the style, but more the characteristics as well as the artists and specific artworks. So the first thing here is the definition of neoclassicism. So in tests and exams, if you are asked what is the definition or define what neoclassicism is, this is going to be your answer. It will most likely be a two mark or three mark answer. So neoclassicism started in the late 18th century, meaning 1700s, and the early 19th century, which is the early 1800s. In neoclassicism, we see that they used very calm and static poses for the persons that they painted in the artworks. And it reminds us of the classical period in Greek art and that the Romans used. Remember, Renaissance was a revisit of the classical times and now we have a revisit again, hence the name Neoclassicism, New Classical Age. Before the French Revolution, um, it was seen as an art to educate people. So they used art to educate people about history, about patriotism, and so on. Some definitions that you need to know. We are going to look at propaganda. We've done propaganda since grade nine. So propaganda is when you are trying to enforce a certain belief or a certain political organization onto other people and propaganda can be in media it can be in art it can be music any kind of uh, means that reaches people um, these monarchs would use to influence them and sometimes it was even deceptive information so they would portray a monarch as being very good and very uh, kind when and as a matter of fact they were not that at all the word of uh, objective means that you are free of bias caused by your personal feelings. So when you are objective, you focus on what is true and what are all the facts rather than what you feel and what your opinion is. And then a word that's important, I don't think it's in your notes, but we are going to look at a revolution, the French Revolution. So what happens during revolutions is that People overthrow governments um, when they're unhappy, they would riot or they would fight and then overthrow the government so that they can start a new order or a new system. Just a little bit of background information. In, the, in France, there was a, a hierarchy system. So what hierarchy means is ranks. Um, and they called it the feudal system in France. So the most important person, the person who had the last say, who made all of the decisions, was the king. And he is at the top of, you will see on this little diagram, the top of the food chain. Under the king is the lords and the vassals. So these people serve under the king. Um, they are also called the aristocrats. Under them, they are knights, and these people serve the lords, and in turn, the lords then serve the king, and so the king also have knights. And then, way at the bottom, we have the peasants or the serfs, and these people are the hard laborers. They do all the farming, they make the clothes, they do everything, and unfortunately, they were treated very badly. Um, they were the only ones who had to pay tax and rent. We can also call them middle class. Okay, so what is the French Revolution? Where did it begin? So the people of France were very unhappy with the government and the middle class decided to have a revolution, stand up to the government. And we see it in the social and the political upheaval in France. So the state of France was almost bankrupt and the middle class said that 
we are paying all of these taxes and we have to pay our rents and then the money is spent and the government is uh, bankrupt. So they were absolutely tired of this and they wanted a new start. So the French Revolution started in 1789. The goal was constitutional monarchy. What this means is they wanted a monarch or a leader that were um, a part of a council and a constitute and this council will then make decisions with the leader the monarch and this they wanted so that they can improve the finances and the p politics of france so king louis the 16th he was dethroned and he was the leader before the revolution started under him, there were only two social classes, and it was the lower class and the upper class. The Roman Catholic Church also had a lot of um, riches in France. And um, after this revolution, the Roman Catholic Church sold their land holdings, so meaning all of the land that they owned, they sold it to the bourgeoisie, which is the middle class. And um, the government sold land to the peasants. So something that happened during the French Revolution, something famous, is called the Reign of Terror. And um, many of the aristocrats, so the people who were under the king, the ruling class, suffered under this reign of terror the bourgeoisie or the middle class took power of france and what happened was quite sad so this revolution was meant to bring freedom to the people of france the oppressed people of france but instead napoleon bonaparte the leader of the revolution brought the reign of terror and he waged war and he had a massive military force and there was a lot of destruction and death under his rule um this reign of terror ended at the defeat of waterloo in 1815. so let's move on to the art of neoclassicism we're going to look at the characteristics so you will see two pictures on the right. The picture at the top is a Rococo painting and the picture at the top is a neoclassical painting. So the first characteristic, if we look at neoclassic art, it's very evident that they focus on political events. So Rococo was this very airy fairy type of style. They try to paint a picture of delicacy and life is good nothing is wrong and the people who made these paintings were the aristocrats and the kings now what the neoclassic artists did they wanted something a little bit more logical and serious they wanted morals to be um, shown in the artworks and this we can see also in the renaissance and classical art number two neoclassicism was there to educate people three the subject matter they usually had figures that were very calm and static so if you look at the article on the right the lady sits quite you can see she sits quite still she's very elegant and um, that's what the word static means static means standing still and then the composition is very balanced and ordered you will see right through neoclassic artworks they used a lot of triangles so let's refer back to this artwork on the right. Um, the triangle would then start at the top of the lady's head. It would continue to the left um, foot, I think, of the couch. And then the right foot of the couch is the third point of the triangle. So we see this kind of a balance in the artwork. Other characteristics or the shapes. If you look at the artworks, you see very harsh outlines and very defined shapes so you can clearly see what they are 
The paint application is very smooth. It's not very expressive. It's very naturalistic and realistic. Color. We see a very bright and strong color in the artworks versus very dark and dull shadowing. A lot of contrast. So if we look, for instance, at the horse, it's almost like there's this holy light shining on it and then very dark contrasting um, shadows in, on the uh, tonal areas, the 3D areas of the horse. Um, and then number eight, no classicism is objective art, intellectual rather than emotional. So the art is a lot more focused on what is fact and what is true rather than what people feel and their own opinions. We're moving on to our first artist. His name is Jacques-Louis David. He was born in 1748 and he passed in 1825. Jacques was seen as a dictator of the arts. He was a very big supporter of the French Revolution and it was mainly because he was also part of the middle class, the bourgeoisie. So he was the, the um, speaker for the artists during this time. So when there happened, there was something that happened where Robespierre, um, a leader, fell from power and it was a leader of a revolution. So he fell from power, he was imprisoned and Jacques decided he still wanted to fight for the cause of the revolution so he started painting for Napoleon Bonaparte. The first artwork we're looking at from David is Jacques Louis David. The name of the artwork is The Oath of Horatio. I'm sure you've seen this painting before we did discuss it very briefly in grade 10 not a discussion but rather you saw it and we spoke about um, for instance the subject matter so this artwork is ob very obviously a political painting we can see because of the patriotic symbols so for instance the swords the war attire the helmets and all of the weapons and the robes that they are wearing so this story was based on an ancient Roman story and the moral of the story is patriotism. So he wanted to show that your honor and your patriotism must be higher than your emotions and your love for certain things, like for instance, your family. So on the left, we have the three Horatii brothers and they are taking on the swords from their father and they're swearing an oath that they will sacrifice their lives for the well-being of their country. Okay. So these brothers volunteered willingly to fight other three brothers from a neighboring state um, who were called the Kureishai brothers. In the background, or no, let's say rather in the middle ground, we see female figures. These are the sisters and the mothers of the brothers who are going into battle. And they are weeping, they are sad. Um, obviously because they don't want to lose their men, but mainly because one of the sisters were engaged to wed one of the Qureshi brothers, which her brothers are off to fight. So these brothers are praised for their patriotism and for not having any emotions or not being influenced by their emotions. The contrast in this artwork is very clear. We have this very strong masculine courage of the men versus the very fem feminine weakness and softness of the women. If we look at the architecture in the background, we see very clear geometric shapes. And in this artwork, it's very clear that there are patterns. So we have three arches. We have three brothers. And on the right, we have three sisters and three swords. So here we have this pattern of three. On the left, we have 
a brother wearing red in the center, the father is wearing red, and on the right, there is a red cloth on the chair. Um, but getting back to the shapes, so we see the arches in the background, which are geometric, but we also see triangles in the artwork. So the uh, arms of the brothers with the arms of the father and the swords create a triangle. The way the father is standing with his legs open create a triangle, the brothers as well. And the females, the way they are seated also creates triangles. Um, let's see, we see very strong contrast between dark and light. So we have that very dark shadowing in the background and then the very light highlights in the foreground, light cloths and so on. And this stark contrast, um, especially the muscles on these men, remind us a lot of the classical sculptures that people made. Then we have the death of Marat, which is also Jacques-Louis David artwork. So the person he painted in this artwork, um, his name is Marat. And he was a politician that fought for the cause of the French Revolution. He was actually one of the leaders of the reign of terror. So what happened to Marat was he was assassinated by an opposing member and her name was Charlotte Corday. A woman um, assassinated him. So the question comes in, why did Marat make, uh, why did Jacques-Louis David make an artwork of Marat? And it is absolutely for um, propaganda. They wanted to boost the momentum of the revolution, to show the people Look at what the opposing party is doing. They are killing off our people. They don't care. So um, we do see idealism in this artwork. I mean, if we look at the figure, he looks quite young. Um, he's masculine, very defined muscles in the arm, and very smooth skin. The actual Marat was actually he was not a very good-looking man. He was older and he had a skin disease, um, which you can see my, um, David did not include in this artwork. So what they wanted to do was to make Marat appear very um, ideal and appealing to the audience so that they would find even more sadness in his story. So David Rea, um, idealized him as a martyr. He was killed because of his beliefs. So that is what a martyr is. Um, he wanted them to think that he was struck down for the good of his people and um, that the truth was not as important as the propaganda. So we, we see now that Marat kind of becomes this Christ-like figure because he died or sacrificed himself for his people and for his cause. He is um, in this bathtub, you can see it's very, it's poor like circumstances. Um, he looks defenseless and um, he was uh, uh, shown as being healthy nothing wrong with him. So they try to show the severity of this assassination. Um, there is a wooden crate next to the bath. And I think it was just to um, add to the message. He was apparently busy writing a letter when he was assassinated. I think this is also part of adding to the propaganda of the artwork, making people feel sorry for him. So we see a very plain background um, in contrast with a very, not busy, but fuller foreground. The artwork's composition is almost cut in half, where we have the foreground that is very full, and then the background that is very dull and empty. So um, we can compare the death of Marat to a sculpture. So Michelangelo was one of the Renaissance sculptures and he made a sculpture of 
Mary holding Jesus after he died. And the name of the sculpture is the Pieta. So you can see the way Jesus is portrayed in the sculpture with his outstretched hand. He seems also very defenseless. It's kind of repeated in the artwork of Marat. Um, this is to enhance the message of Marat being a person who sacrificed himself for his cause and he is dying for the people. There is very little blood, um, so it's showing that it's not a very violent death. And then there is a turban wrapped around his head and this with the holy light or a very holy type light shining onto Marat um, creates this feeling of a halo. So it's also enhancing the feeling of a uh, Christ figure. So guys, make sure you complete activity 1.1 on page 22 for homework. We are going to check it when you are back at school.